we were dealing with the issue of sin and sin consciousness and how that Christians today are so conscious of sin and not wanting to sin that they live every day in fear of sin. Sure. And for this reason, every time they come to God, they have to make sure, forgive me, Father, where I have failed you, and confess their sins before they can even open their hearts to God. Um, based on what the scripture says um, and what we have looked at so far, in fact, I think the tapes will be ready in about uh, two weeks after, so you'll get the gist there. But the, uh, a sister was saying that she's getting the point. And the point is, that last verse we read was from 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. That says, God made Jesus to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. In other words, we are all made righteous the moment we are in Christ. In other words, the moment His life becomes yours. You are made righteous. You are no more a sinner, but you are a saint. That's what the Bible teaches. And I believe if we can believe, we can, or faith can lay hold on this. You know, what's the theme? Do you remember what the theme of our camp meeting is? Oh, some didn't remember. Oh yeah, it's right there. What's the theme? Our only hope. And you know, everybody will say, who is our only hope? Jesus. And we all know that. But why is it that we don't have that hope? It's because our faith has not laid hold on Him, the person, Jesus. And that's, what, that's the person we want to lift up, high up, because He's deserving, Brother James, of all glory, praise, and honor. And Jesus is our life. He is our only hope. But we only receive Him how? By faith. By faith. Until you're able to take hold of this reality. Then we'll live every day desiring and hoping that one day we'll be better. Yeah. But we are made already better in Him. If our, if our faith can lay hold on that. Now, we decided that we'd split the sermon in two because we didn't want to get it mixed up. Because there's another part to this. There's a reason why we live in a sin conscious environment. There's a reason why we are so conscious of sin and not conscious of righteousness. There's, so, there's a reason why we're conscious of our faults and not conscious of, of our gift. And the other reason is what we want to look at now. Okay, so this is part two. And the, the, the title, do you remember? Let God be true. So it's Paul writing to the Romans. Do you remember what the other half of that verse says? And every man a liar. So what we're looking at, we want the Bible to teach us. We want the Spirit to lead us. We don't want to listen to any man. Because every man is a liar. But God alone is true. God alone is good. God alone is holy. God alone is true. Alright. The root of our sin consciousness is built upon another principle and that principle is what we want to delve into this evening and that is law consciousness it's interesting please note the time it's 7 15 thank you now law consciousness there is a verse i'd like for you to take a note of and that verse is in first corinthians first corinthians chapter Very short verse, very simple verse, yet it's a profound verse. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 56. 1 Corinthians 15, 56. We there? Let's read that one together. What does it say? The sting of death is... And the strength of sin is the law. Alright. Have you seen that verse before? Alright. Now Paul says, When sin stings you, what's the result? Death. But he says, The strength of sin is what, beloved? I'm here to say that... The the major problem with sin consciousness is law consciousness. Did you know that? 
That's our major problem, law consciousness. And I'm sure Brother David dealt with that issue just now. And, um, and as he said, there are people who are very offended by us just dealing with the issues as they are. But I'll tell you what, I have no fear and you should, be, you should never be fearful. Why? We are looking at the Bible together. I'm not giving you my thoughts, my ideas. We're just going to open the Bible. We're just going to look at what the Bible says and see if what we're saying, the Bible says so. <laughs> and then when we're done, let God be true. That's it. That's it. And so I have no fear to examine what the Bible says, John. I'm pretty open to that, and um, I wish others would be. Anyway, the law then is the strength of sin. Isn't that what Paul just said? So, the more bent you are to the law, is the more bent you will be to sin. The more you're aware of law, is the more you'll be aware when you step out of line with law. Isn't that right? Of course. I got my first speeding ticket in America. I got it just down there not too long ago, some two, a day or two days ago, yes. <laughs> and you know what? When I sit around the stair and I just went down to Home Depot, I'm just conscious of the speed I'm going. I'm just conscious. I'm looking for the signs and I'm making sure I'm like five below. <laughs> I'm, I'm not even depending on the grace. <laughs> five below. Anyway. So, the law. What, what was the purpose of the law? Because this is where I think we make a big mistake. When we don't understand why law was given, and we think law is for a different reason than it really was intended, then we end up in problems. And that's what we want to just examine a little bit to see what the purpose of the law was. And if we understand what the purpose was, then we can understand that the law is good. In fact, there's a verse that I'd like for you. Look at this verse for me. 1 Timothy 1, I think I have that right, and verse 8. Read that verse for me, and I want you to keep that in mind. We are not against the law. We can never be against the law. 1 Timothy 1, 8. Is that it? I should just check it. Are we there? Yeah. If you get there, just read it for me. Is that correct? We know that the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. Oh, yes, that's the verse. That's a good verse. Did you get that one? Mm -hmm. For we know that the law is what, beloved? Good. good. If a man uses it how? Lawfully. lawfully. So, let's make this point and make it firm and clear. There is a lawful use of the law. That's what the Bible says. Uh, Paul says in Romans 7 that, that we know that the law is holy, just, and good. An Alright, so there must be an unlawful use of the law that make it unholy, unjust, and ungood. Possibly? Alright, let's see. Let's go to Romans chapter 3 quickly. Uh, Romans 3. It's interesting when, when Paul writes... And his choice of words. Romans chapter 3. Look at how he begins here in verse 19. Romans 3. I, I, I tend to see to think we're a little slow. Am I correct in that? I'm, I hope it's not the food. Okay. Romans 3. Let's start in verse 19. Are we there? Yes. Okay, let's go. I like that. Now we know. So he's speaking to some people who were aware of the things he's now saying. And he says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, is said to them who are aware, beloved? <laughs> Under the law. Why? That every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Now, I want to stop for a moment and consider the term used here. The term used is under the law. Here's what Paul says. We know that when the law speaks, it speaks to those whom the law governs. Yeah. Under the law, I've come to find, does not mean what I was taught it meant. They taught me that under the law, 
means you're under the condemnation of the law. See, when I pulled out at, at North Dryden Road and, and came on the highway, as long as I was below 60 miles an hour, that's what the policeman said to me. He said, this is a 60 mile zone. I was doing like 73. But it was good. He charged me just for five miles over, so it was not as bad. So, as long as I was under 60, I was under the law governance. But as, as soon as I went over 60, I became under the law's condemnation so they told me so every time I see this idea this this term under the law that's what they said it meant to be condemned by the law but careful examination even if this verse will tell you that doesn't make sense to be under the law simply means to be governed by the law to be under its authority or rule my kids are under my government well Myself and my wife. They're under our government, our rule. So when we speak, when I speak, I mean, it has happened so many times. I'll just say, come here. Nobody has responds. But my, my child said, me daddy? Just like that. Because my, the voice of authority speaks to those who are under that voice's governance, right? <laughs> Let's get back to the verse. We know this, that whatever the law says, it says to them who are under the law. Under the law's government or control. That's only who the law can talk to, right? That every mouth may be stopped, don't forget this now, this is one of the reasons it was given. That every mouth may be stopped and all the world will become guilty before God. Next verse. Therefore, in light of what we just said, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Are you getting there? Okay, let's recap. The law then was given to point out sin. The law was given so that you may become guilty before God. That's the purpose of the law. Think for a moment then. Could the law help the... Oh, 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 somebody gave me a very interesting um, scenario of something that happened real. They went to a place and there was water there and they decided to swim. But there was a, a signpost standing there right at the, uh, on, uh, on the, the front area. It wasn't the beach of such. And it says, thou shalt not swim here. But they jumped in the water anyway. Against the law. And as they were swimming, one of them got in some difficulty. And they said, when they looked around, all they could see is the same sign saying, thou shalt not swim here. Could the law have helped them? No. So the law was there to give a rule, to say... This is your condition. The law here says, you must do this. You are to respond to this law, but how do you respond? Do you have the power to do as the law says? So all that the law can say to you, you are a sinner. You're going to die. You're a sinner. You're going to die. It could not help you. In fact, the next verse makes more sense as we get to verse 20. Where are we now? Yes. 21. But now, the righteousness of God, what's the next phrase, beloved? I don't want you to miss that one. I think the Bible is so plain. I mean, the Bible is, is such a teacher. When you, go, when you just put aside all my preconceived and sit down to look at what it says, it just makes so much sense, doesn't it? But now he says, the righteousness of God, how? Without the law is revealed, is manifested, is being demonstrated, being witnessed by the law and the prophet. Now think about this. When the righteousness of God comes, does it come by the law? 
Hmm? We just read it, the verse, first, Second Corinthians 5, 21. That we might be made how? The righteousness of God, where? In Christ, not by the law. And here Paul says, no, the righteousness of God is revealed. And if the law looks at the righteousness and says, mm-hmm, pure righteousness. He says, the law witnesses this righteousness. It has nothing to do with law. It was without law. It was not by obedience to law that its righteousness came. No! This righteousness came because of a life that was without sin. A sinless, perfect, righteous life came without law. And even the law witnessed and testified. And the prophets testified, this is pure righteousness. Next verse, 22. 22. Even the righteousness of God, hallelujah, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Does that make sense to you? That's too much? The righteousness of God, he says, the righteousness that he's talking about here, now this righteousness is... Reveal, and this righteousness is without the law. And it's the righteousness of God. So, does it make more sense now when we look at Romans 6 and verse 14? What does that verse say? Romans 6 and verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion. I want another word for the word dominion. Power, Power, another word. Control, another word. Rule, another word. Authority, sin is not your government. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Why? For you're not under the law's rule or government. What is he saying? He's saying, Every man, woman, and child who is governed by law must sin. Every person who is governed by law will sin. That's a must. He says, now sin shall not have dominion over you. Sin shall no longer rule your life because you are no longer under the law. What are you under? Grace. And what is the grace of God? Who is the grace of God? Jesus Jesus Christ. When Jesus comes to live inside, Jesus produces what you could not produce by looking at law. He gives you the righteousness of God. How? He gives you this righteousness by a miracle. What's the miracle? His life becoming my life. What's the miracle? That my body is His temple. He lives in me and walks in me. And His righteousness is made, is demonstrated in this body. Amen. That's why when the word says, I am dead, that's what it means to be surrendered. I am dead, that's what it means to be crucified. Paul says, I am dead, I am crucified with Christ. You see me living? He said, it's not me who lives. Jesus, Jesus, he says, that lives in me. Galatians chapter 5. I mean, the Bible, the Bible is so beautiful when you look at this. Forget what you were taught by others. Go to the Word and say, Jesus, you teach me. This is what you promised. That when you come, you're going to guide me. You teach me. Here's what he says in Galatians chapter 5. I mean, there's so much. I mean, but I think we can get the highlights of what is being said here. Galatians chapter 5, and we probably will stay in Galatians a little bit. Galatians 5 and verse 18. Look at what he says. It's just a simple verse. Mm. But if you are... Oh, you're not there. I'll give you some time. Galatians 5.18. What does the verse say? But if you are what, beloved? Mm -hmm. Is that making sense to you? If you are led by who? Who is the Spirit? Second Corinthians 3 and verse... 17 says, but the Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Liberty. And he says, if you are led by the Spirit, you are at liberty. Now he says, he that is led by the Spirit is what? Not under the law. 
You're at liberty. You're in liberty. You're not led by rules. You don't have the authority, this, this governing authority of law over you. No! Because you're not just human. You are more than human. You have a divine nature. Not just that, the very life of the Almighty God comes and lives in you and rules you. The problem we have is to allow him his place. Let's go back to 1 Timothy. Beautiful passage. We know that the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. 1 Timothy 1. Now, I found this very interesting because the next verse was hard to grasp until you understand certain things clear. Verse 9, First Timothy 1. Remember what 8 says? We know that the law is good if a man uses it how? Lawfully. But look at the next verse, verse 9 and 10 and 11. Knowing this, that the law was not made for who, beloved? Look at what the verse says. He says, we know that the law is not made for a righteous man, but it's made for who? The lawless. And who? The disobedient. For the ungodly and for sinners. For unholy and profane. For murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers. For manslayers, for warmongers. For them that defile themselves with mankind. For men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons. And if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. What is he saying? He's saying no righteous man is governed by law. He says the law was not even made for you. The law was simply made to make men know their state and their need. That's all. It was there to let you know I am a sinner and I need a savior. When you would have understood what the law says and go to find the Savior, then the law would have done its perfect work. Would the law have been abolished then? No! Because there are more sinners that need to find out who they are. You getting the point? So the law has its work. It's a lawful work, a good work. And it is to let sinners know their state and their need. You know, Jesus said how the Jews were doing a good thing. And I suppose you'd be saying the same thing of us here. He said they were searching the scriptures for eternal life. And he said that the scriptures actually was bringing them to this eternal life. But where was the eternal life? Was it in the scriptures? Have oh, you read that verse before? It's in, 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 where is that verse? In John? John 5? 39, that's right sister. He says, you search the scriptures. For you think in them you have eternal life. And he says, yes, they are they which testify of me. But don't stop there. The next verse he says, and yet you will not come to me that you may have life. That's the whole point. The law was there to lead you to Christ. It was there to let you know you are a sinner. You're going to die. You need a savior. And the law could not give you that savior. The law, the law was not that savior. In fact, we look at that. Um, if I can get down to it. The law could not save you. Only Jesus saves. Now, I'm sure there are many people who are having problems with this issue. And I'm hoping to address this. We, we do have time, don't we? Yes. I'm hoping to address this. And, and especially, you know, the, the, the law keepers like to say, but Brother, if this is what you're saying, what do we do with the Sabbath? Oh, just, just take it easy. We'll get there. And it's so beautiful, John. When you look at the, the reality, it's so beautiful because there are many people, well, 
I'm ahead of myself. There are many people who, who think that, you know, I worship God because the law says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And that's why I keep the Sabbath, because the law says so. Well, isn't that a very sorrowful reason for keeping the Sabbath? Huh? Did Jesus keep the Sabbath? Yes. Was that because of the law? Mm. See, the men who had the rules and lived by the rules were saying, Hey, you're breaking it. They didn't know what true Sabbath observance was about. They did not know that Sabbath was about a relationship, a special relationship with, with God and His creation. They didn't know that. They thought it was rule. So they made rules and tell you, don't go more than this amount of journey on the Sabbath. Don't do this on the Sabbath. Don't do that. Don't we still have them today? Yeah. <laughs> it's not about the rule. Yeah. It's God's perfect plan for His creation. On the seventh day, God... Bless the Sabbath. Do you know that? When was the Sabbath blessed? Before or after? Before. You'll check it out. After. Before or after what? Before or after. When was the Sabbath blessed? I know. After. He said he blessed it because that in it he rested. Go look at what it says. He had an experience and when this experience was over, he says, I want this every other week. Every week. Thank you. Every week. <laughs> so, that's the reason for true Sabbath fellowship and communion with Him. Not because the rule says, Oh Lord, I'm following your rules. What rules? It's the heart, right? Alright, let's get down to that, that passage now. Uh, here, well, Romans spoke a few, um, Paul, sorry, spoke a few things here in Romans. We'll probably just skip over that for a moment and get down to the real section in Galatians 3. Let's go over to Galatians chapter 3. And this is a familiar passage, but uh, Galatians, let's... Maybe we could start in verse 10. Verse 10 is, would probably be, be, yes, Galatians 3 and verse, and verse 10. And this is interesting. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. I'm going to read that again. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. Why? For it is written... Cursed is everyone that continueth not in, how many beloved? All. All things which are written in the book of the law to do them. What is he saying? Well, James said it this way, if you keep the whole law and offend in one point, you're... You know what he said? You're guilty of all. Here Paul says... Those who, whose righteousness are based on the works of the law are under the curse. What's the curse? Cursed is every man that doeth not what? All things that are written in the book of the law. That's the point. The point is, for you to keep the law perfectly, you have to keep all, every bit of the law for you to be righteous. Now, do you know of anybody who have done that? Yeah. Interesting. Let's go to the next verse. But that no man is justified in the, by the law in the sight of God. What is he saying here? But, conjunction, let me tell you something. If you think you can keep it all to be righteous, look at what he says next. But that no man is justified, made just or right by the law in the sight of God. It is evident. For the just shall live, how beloved? By faith. By faith. And the law is not of faith. That's the next verse. Are you getting it? Yeah. No man is ever made right by obedience to law. No man is ever made right by keeping the Ten Commandments. No man. That's what he says. And he says this is evident. 
You're never justified by law obedience. Never. Who justifies you? Christ. We're justified by what? His life. And that's what it says in Romans 5. By His life we are justified. We are made right by His life. Why? It's the miracle of the changed life. It's the miracle of self dying and Christ coming, the born again experience dead. That's what justifies us. His righteousness. Could we ever be justified by our works? That's what He says. And He says, the just this is evident because he says the just shall live by his faith. When you check it out in um, in Habakkuk two, that's what he says. The just f shall live by his faith, and the law is not of faith. Don't mix them up. That is why we have a mongrel religion trying to produce by our working and trying to earn when it is a gift. That's why Paul says, "Don't frustrate the grace." <coughs> Don't frustrate the grace of God. You know, how do you, how do you frustrate God's grace? When He's giving you a gift and He says, So, so um, how much? How much? He says, No, it's a gift. He says, No, my, you, you have to charge something. It can't, you know. They, taught, they, they, they told us when we were growing up, they said, Nothing that is, that is good is cheap or free. Don't you, don't you know that? And I don't mean to, to, to knock China or anything, you know, most times they're saying, um, how much for it? Oh, it must be from China. Right. But I, I mean, consider it. And you're saying, if it's that cheap, it can't be worth much, you know? If it's that cheap, it's no good. But here Paul says, Christ redeemed us. Verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us, as it is written, Cursed is everyone that hung it on a tree. So he became the curse. He became sin. Didn't we read that? He became sin. He, be he took the curse upon himself that we might receive the gift, the righteousness, the glorification of God in him. What a salvation we have. So interesting. Because God made this plan long ago. That all those who would come through the seed would come back to him in union. That was the plan. That was the plan from Eden. That was the plan. And all that we see in the Old Testament taking place was a working out of the plan. Until the fullness of time came. Hallelujah! God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. See, it wasn't condemnation, right? right. To redeem them that were under the law. Consider this then. Who governs you? What governs you? Law can only touch your behavior. Did you know that? Law can't touch your heart. Law can't deal with your nature. Law can say, do this and don't do that. It cannot change the heart that is in you. You need a miracle. Doctors can't do it. It's not a surgery. It's the miracle of a transformed life. It's the miracle that can make a clean thing out of an unclean. That's the miracle that Jesus gives to humanity. That's the miracle that, Christ, that, that sets Christianity above every other religion. And that is why Christianity is going to be the religion of the universe. Amen. It's the religion of Christ. That is why this reality of Christ in us, the hope of glory, is going to swell and become a great mountain and fill the entire earth. That's what the prophecy says. In the days of kings, James, in the days of men taking over the kingdoms of, of earth and thinking they are, God is going to do something. He says a stone is going to be cut out without hand. And the stone is going to do some work. Well, you know what? I'm, I'm in that stone kingdom. He's in me and I know. That's the reality. When he's in you, you know. It's not a question. Are you born again? Hmm. You should know. Right. If he's in you, you know. Amen. You can feel him. You can know the moves. Because he's there. So, 
Jesus did something that I've thought about, I've never heard talked about much. But Jesus redeemed humanity. He came, conquered sin, went back, and was glorified. You know, in John 7, it says that, that that great day, the day of the feast, he cried and said, If any man thirst, come unto me. It says that the Holy Ghost was not yet given because he was not what? Glorified. When he went and was glorified, the new humanity came at Pentecost. And that new humanity, when it came on that day, just one day, 120 preachers. Did you know? There were 120. On that day, 3,000 were added to the church, James. Two weeks later, 5,000 at the gates get beautiful. Um, another six or so weeks, um, the, 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 the entire city of Samaria. I mean, when, when, when these men realized the reality of this Christ that says he was going to come back, he says, tarry at Jerusalem until you be imbued with power. Then you're going to be my witness. Jesus says, you shall receive power. And they received him. And they became witnesses. They knew what was happening in them. And the gospel was published throughout the region. I mean, I mean it's, when you look at the book of Acts, you're getting a glimpse of what's going to be happening in our day. Don't believe that the, the gospel would have started in such blaze of glory and end like this? Impossible! Ten times greater. Oh, ten. Not ten. Not ten. Not ten for sure. It's, it's, it's going to be wonderful. And so much so because I can feel it. So much so because we'll talk about the signs of the time later on. We'll talk about what is happening in the world and how you can see and know that we are right, right there. Right there. That's right. Yeah. And when you see it happening on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the political scene, you know, you're just looking, where's the spiritual part? Where is it? Because that must come. Right. He just promised and it's coming. So, here's what Jesus did. It's beautiful. Here's what He did. While we were yet sinners, He did something. Do you remember what He, he did? Oh, come on. While we were yet sinners, what did Jesus do? He died for us. He died for us. What does mean? What does that mean? Well, long before we were born, Laurie, the life that would have come to us was predestined to destruction. It was Adam's life. Lost. In that life was nothing good. All that was in that life was self and selfishness. That would have produced only sin. But long before we were born, Jesus did something. Jesus conquered that condemned life. Long Jesus put an end to that curse. And it was a new life was left in Jesus. All we had to do when we were born was to discover our true reality and recognize our true destiny. And then Jesus would have been there to say, but there's life everlasting, life eternal over here. If you'll just come to me, if you'll just allow me. I can give you everlasting life. If you'll just allow me, you'll receive the very life of God that will make you into righteous beings. And these righteous beings would have become magnets to attract people to this reality. Amen. That's right. Well, Jesus did something just by that one act. Jesus changed the definition for sin. Did you know that? Paul hinted at it in Romans 14, 23, and he says, For whatsoever is not, that last part of the verse says, For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. It's interesting. The world, then, will not be lost. Sinners will not be lost because of their carnal natures. Sinners will be lost because they have not accepted Jesus. You know what John says? John 3.19. Are you familiar with this verse? 
And this is the condemnation. What's the condemnation? This, this is, there's only one condemnation since Jesus came. Only one. What's the condemnation? Light is come. But men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because your deeds were evil. The condemnation is not accepting Jesus. The condemnation is not receiving Him. That's the condemnation. The condemnation is not because of what Adam did. Jesus undid that long ago. So I am now in the limelight, and you are in the limelight. And everybody that says, I'm, I'm of Christ, everybody that calls the name Jesus is there. Why? Because we have a mission. Our mission is to go to the world and let them know God is reconciled to you. Be ye reconciled to God. That's our ministry. Our ministry is to let the world know Jesus saves. He wants to change you. But we have been... Doing what others have told us to do. Go and preach them to them the law. Tell them they must keep the Sabbath. No, 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 no. Tell them Jesus loves them. Tell them He wants to change them. Leave the Sabbath thing to Jesus. He'll do a better job of it, don't you think? Amen. And put aside your doctrines. That's not what people... Doctrines never saves. Only Jesus saves. What they need is Jesus. What you need is, what I need is Jesus. And when I have Jesus, you know what he says? That the water that I shall give you shall be in you a well. Have you ever read that one? A well of living water just flowing. Yeah. Everlasting life. That's what he says. Amen. And we, so we are the reservoirs. But it's filled with him. His life flowing out of us. Others seeing it and desiring it. That's why when he was here, so many went after him because there was something coming out of him that they wanted. I look around, where is this kind of life? I look at our young people, I look at, at, the, at the, the careers that they choose. Why? It's because there's nothing else. They don't see a life that is flow. I mean, when Paul was alive, when Barnabas and, and all these men, the, 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 the young people wanted to be missionaries. I'd like to be like Paul. Because they could see God at work in men's life. They could see it and they could desire it because it was right there in their midst. Yeah, that's right. What's happening today? It's interesting. Christians do not live by law. Christians live by the life of God in them. Christians are constrained, they are compelled and forced by what is in them. The love that is in them, that is what drives them. That's what God does in them. So Paul says, after he says, I was dead and crucified, he said, the life I know live in the flesh. Have you read that one? Mm -hmm. How do I live it? I live by the faith of the Son of God. Hallelujah. Who loves me and does what? And gave himself for me. I heard a story. A true story. Happened back in the days when racism was full-blown happened in the south, I think it was Mississippi, that a black man was provoked and in self-defense committed murder. Well, he was locked up, was imprisoned, and he became very bitter. He was bitter with the system because it was unfair. And he could not understand how things like this were was left to go on and how he would suffer and die because of what happened. Well, you know, there were some witnesses that saw what happened. And so they petitioned the governor. And something interesting happened because the man was granted a state pardon. He was pardoned. And so the government would have the governor, sorry, would have taken this pardon to him 
in jail. By this time he was on death row. He was so bitter. The bitterness that, that, that was built up in him was so much that when the governor came, he actually dressed as a priest. And so the warden told him, there's someone to see. Who is it? He said, it's a priest. Some, somebody said, ah, I don't want to see anybody. So the governor sat in the waiting area. And he refused to come. He sat for about 30 minutes and then he left with the pardon in his pocket. A few of the wardens knew what took place and they said to him, Man, you're such a fool. He said, I don't care. He said, Do you know who that was? Who? That was the governor. He had the state's pardon. Pardon for you. Really? Why don't you tell him to come back? No chance. It's over. Well, you know, he lived a regretful couple of months. How he never accepted this. He was too bitter and it came disguised. The day of his execution came and before, I think he was hanged, before they hanged him, he said he wanted to say something. It was interesting. He said, I want you to know here that I'm not dying because of what I was framed about. I'm not dying because I murdered a man. I'm dying because I refused the state's pardon. Think about that for a moment. Because this is the reality of what Jesus did, what God did in Jesus for humanity. He has pardoned us, redeemed us, made us righteous already in Jesus. Remember where this is? It's where? In Jesus, nowhere else. All of this is wrapped up and put down in Jesus for you, waiting for you. And Jesus is pursuing you. And He wants you to know, I'm here to give this to you freely. You want to be redeemed? You want to be relieved of your stress and your pain? You want to be relieved of, of constantly trying and failing? He says, come to Jesus. And I will give you what? Rest. rest. Don't you want this rest? Amen. The rest is there. But your eyes must be fixed on Him, the dove of peace. The, your eyes must be fixed on Him, on this reality that is in Him. And don't listen to anybody else. I've done that for a long time. Listen to people. Listen to people tell me who I am. Instead of listening to what God says and who God says that I am, He says that I'm His Son. What does that mean? John says, Beloved, you've read that one? Beloved, what manner of love? No, behold, did you know what He says? Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called, what, beloved? The sons of God. Have you read that verse where he says, As he is, so are you in this world. Have you read that verse before? That's what he says. He says, As God is, so are you in the world. Will we allow him to be true in us? Will we allow this reality to take a hold of us? Will we stop listening to the devil's lies? Will we stop listening to what others have to say and listen to what God says? Will we take a hold of this reality and know that in Him we are perfect in His sight? Can you do anything that surprises God? 
Can you do anything that turns God away from you? If you understand Him to be so loving. See, your issue is this. Your issue and my issue is this. We are losing sight of all reality. When we lose sight of all reality, we fall in somebody else's reality. Let us fight the good fight of what? Faith. Faith. That's the fight we have. The fight to believe. The fight to know. The fight to know my reality. And live in my reality. And regardless of what you say, I know who I am. So this boy came to this old port. And stood with his two suitcases. And the people came to tell him, Little boy, ships doesn't dock here anymore. And he was just a happy guy. He was just smiling. And he says, no, really, really. You're not believing. It's the truth. And so they got everybody to come from the village to come to tell him. It's the truth. Ships doesn't dock here anymore. And he was very silent and pleasant. Three days, John. They heard a ship's horn. To their amazement, the town came out to sea. And the ship came and docked. And then he spoke. He said, I knew the ship would come. My father is the captain. <laughs> so I want you to think for a moment. Is it your father that you're listening to? Or the villagers? Is it your father that you're listening to that makes you know who you are? Or you're listening to those that says, you should never say you're saved. You should never say you're a saint. You just don't know when you will sleep. Whose hands are, in, are you in? Now unto him who is able... I mean, we, we, we quote these verses, we quote them. Yeah. Unto him who is able to do what? To keep you from falling. Who is that? And are you saying I'm proud to put myself in his hand? Are you saying that I should not be talking too loud? Because I tell you I am in his hand? Now I never told you I have power to overcome. What I have told you, he lives in me. And the same way he lived in Jesus and did a work in Jesus, he says he is going to do the same work in me. How that God anointed, you know, you've read that one. How that God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost and with power. And he went about doing good. Why? He was keeping the law. Is that what it says? No. It says God was in him. The only reason you're going to reflect his image perfectly. Is because you would have surrendered to him perfectly. And he would have had his perfect way in you. So indeed, my body is the temple. Indeed, when Paul says, He that is dead is freed from sin. It's the truth. Indeed, this is the reality. When I give myself to Him and says, I'm yours, use me. I'm tired. I'm tired of trying and failing. Here I am. Use me. Do what you want. I'm done. He says, that's what I was waiting for. Because that's what we do. We fight Him. We fight Him. He comes and He lives in us. And you know what is, uh, Paul says in Hebrews, you've read this one in, verse 13, in chapter 13, He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Somebody says, that's what Ruth said to Naomi. Yes. But that's what Jesus says to you. Go look at it. Hebrews 13, He tells you, I will never leave you nor forsake you. This is something God will never do. Turn away from you. You will and may, but not Him. The fight then is who will live. That's your struggle. That's my struggle. Every day, every moment, even now. The question is, who will you listen to? Will you listen to what the Spirit says? Or no, I, have not, I was not taught that. I'm, I was taught something else and that's what I'm going to believe. Or will you be listening to Him? When you live, when you respond to your environment, who is responding? Is it you or is it Him? In you. That's, all, that's your fight. That's my fight. And it's the only way victory can come. When I decide, you Father, and only you. It doesn't matter anymore. 
I don't have any rep a name. I don't have a reputation. I have nothing to save. It's all for him. Did he have a name and a reputation when he was going to the cross? It was all for you. And because you love me this much, I want to love you in return. And just give myself for your service. And that's what he's asking for. That's what he's asking for. Your surrender. So he can make a beautiful thing out of your life. Amen. He can take your body and make it into something beautiful. He can save a world through you. He can reach your neighbors through you. It might not be a big name, John. But the work would be beautiful. Because others will have seen Jesus. And come to meet him and know him. And experience him personally. I appreciate your time. Beloved, I know I've been a little short. <laughs> for a change. But it was good. Um, I just want you to keep that, that focus. Because that's really what, I, what we intend for you to, to see. Your only hope is Jesus. But to access Jesus, that's the issue. To access him by faith. To know the reality of who you are in him. Because his words cannot fail. It's impossible for God to lie. And he says that he will come and make his home with you. Not just him. My, my father and I. That's what he says. We'll come and make our home. I want him to come and live in me and live in you. And let me tell you, you, you don't have a clue what the end is going to look like. When we let go in his hand and say, take me, it's your glory, not mine. That's my intention, it's my, it's my hope, my dream. I'm looking forward to it with all my heart.